Well, hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 221 of the Extra Mile podcast for bar exam takers. This is your host, Jackson Mummy. I'm glad you're with us today. Um, I don't know about you, but some days just they're just weird days and everything that you plan doesn't happen and everything you were ready to do doesn't work out the way you expected it to do. And I got to be honest, today is one of those days. We had been waiting to do this episode and planning and putting it together. And just so you know, typically what we do is we batch our episodes and uh, then I record the introductions uh, uh, on a more timely basis because obviously we're in that period now where bar exam results are coming out. So you might recall that last week uh, in our episode, I said that I thought I had a spidey sense that the New York bar exam results would be coming out this current week that this episode is releasing, and that I thought it would probably happen on Monday night, right after midnight. Well, that's been the tradition and the norm in New York is to release bar results right after midnight. And I felt pretty good about the fact that the 22nd or 23rd of October was probably the release date based on historical precedent. Well, Monday comes, there's no bar results. Monday night comes, no bar results. Monday midnight comes, no bar results. I wake up at 1 a.m., no bar results from New York. Okay, fine, not going to happen. My spidey sense was wrong. I get up on Tuesday and I think, okay, I'm going to do a different kind of uh, podcast episode today. And I was all set. We were preparing and getting that all ready to go off. And then about 9 a.m. Eastern time, email blows up. New York bar results have come out. Now, I have no idea why the New York bar examiner suddenly decided that they were going to release results during business hours, like everybody else in the world does. Uh, But I just want to say thanks so much, New York bar, for switching it up and not telling anybody you were going to do it. So everything that we had done, we just tore it up. I felt a little bit like Rachel Maddow on a Friday night, just tear up the show and start all over again. And so we're flying without a net today. Um, I wanted to bring you up to speed as much as I can on the early, early results coming out of the New York bar. And then I thought what I'd do, because I wasn't quite sure what else would be going on, is that I did some excerpts from a live Q&A that we do for our registered students every week. I'm joined on that with um, our group coaching uh, coordinator, Kelly Perkins, who has been on the uh, the show before and, and does some Q&A with me. And I think you'll find it interesting. We talk about a wide variety of subjects, and I'll come to those in just a minute. But I thought it'd be interesting for you to hear what we say to our students as they're preparing and starting and studying. So we're going to get to that in just a minute. But obviously, the big news here is New York bar results coming out, um, and we have some official statistics there. Now, before I get to the New York results, let me just say that we still expect in this week in which this episode would be released, we still think we're going to see Texas results and Georgia results. So we've got two big states. We expect uh, somewhere in the next few days. So if you're waiting for your results in Texas or Georgia, good luck to you. Uh, If you're a New York bar taker, you should have gotten your email with your results by now. Now, Let me jump right into the New York results and then uh, sort of tell you what I I think based on on what I'm reading. Um, The examiners have released uh, the following press release. They examined uh, 9,679 candidates in July. Um, This was 253 fewer candidates than before, and it was the lowest number of candidates for a July test since 2004. This is a trend we're seeing around the country. There are fewer and fewer people taking the bar exam. I suspect a certain amount of this is discouragement over the test. I think another part of it is that more people are deciding that law school isn't worth it, Um, and we're certainly seeing uh, the decrease in law school admissions as well. But in any event, fewer people taking the test. Now, the examiners trumpet right out the the box a very misleading number. They use the number 83% pass rate, which, boy, that would be awesome. That'd be like the best in the whole world. Well, actually, what they're talking about is first-time bar takers from ABA accredited law schools. And while that's a great number for that group, I mean, it should be higher still, um, it's it's a great number, but it's really not the lead. The lead is that there were, um, of the 9,679 people who were tested, 6,095 passed. The overall pass rate is 63%. Now, this number is not very good. But it's going to look very good when we see California results later, and it certainly looks good compared to, say, the Florida results that we've got. Um, So why the disparity? What moves that uh, dial from 83% down to 63%? Well, the the big item here are the number of foreign trained candidates. 
We've been suggesting for some time that if you're a foreign trained attorney, the exam to sit for in the United States is the New York UBE. And obviously a lot of people are taking that advice, not just from us, but I'm sure from other people as well. And so 33%, a full third of all the candidates who sat in the July New York bar exam were foreign trained attorneys. This was a record number, the most that they've ever had. The passing rate for this group of people, however, was 41%. And so when you take that 41% for one third of your bar taking audience, you can see you've got a, a, a major discrepancy. So foreign trained attorneys, big group of them. 41% um, is better than they'll do in, in Florida or California or Texas or Georgia would be my guess, uh, but still not a very successful pass rate overall. So when we break down the pass rates by smaller groupings, <clears throat> when we get to, um, as I said, all ABA grads were 83% for first time takers. Foreign educated first time takers had a 50% pass rate. So, you know, it's a reasonable shot. Um, so the overall first time pass rate was 74%. And I'm guessing that that will be one of the higher percentiles across the country when all the results are in. As I say, certainly better than a couple of other major states. Now, what about all the foreign educated students, first time and repeaters? Well, as I said, that was 41%. And the overall pass rate for first time and repeaters is 63%. Now, the examiners go on to say that um, while performance declined in July as compa or compared to July 2017, the rates were what they said generally in line with recent results. And they went back to July 2016 and July 2014 for that uh, uh, that. Uh, comparison and <clears throat> basically said, well, we're in line with what we did back in 2016 and 2014. Um, I don't know. I think that's, that's fairly small uh, consolation. These are not fabulous numbers. Now, I think they're better numbers uh, than we're going to get in other places, uh, but they're not numbers that should make you jump up and down and say, oh boy, it's easy to pass the bar. I will say that, again, the UBE, the fact that you can sit for the UBE, wave your score in. If you don't get the 266 here, but maybe you get a 260, uh, if you're not a foreign trained attorney, you've got a reasonable shot at uh, getting waved into other jurisdictions, and that's good news. So there are certainly people that are doing that. We're seeing that strategy, as we've talked about in an earlier episode of the podcast, working pretty well for people, uh, switching out of a state like California or Florida or Texas or Georgia, and going to the uh, UBE exam, and certainly sitting in New York is one of the places to do it. Another interesting note just about the New York exam, um, for years, the way that uh, the location has been set up uh, to sit for the exam uh, is that you are assigned a location for your test based on whether you're an in-state or out-of-state resident or you went to law school in New York, um, and you could make a, re a request within those uh, recommendations. Essentially, it meant that if you were not a New York resident <clears throat> and did not attend law school in New York, you were probably going to Albany or Buffalo. Well, now the examiners, again, for unknown reasons, have decided they're not going to do that anymore. You can now request your location, but they've made very clear that there's no guarantee you'll get the location you requested. So for those of you that want to take the exam at the Javits Center in New York, um, request it. Uh, you'll find out late in the game whether or not you got there or whether you get to trek uh, north uh, to Rochester or Buffalo or Albany. So those are exciting places to go in February for sure. In any event, um, there's some new rules in New York. You want to make sure that you're aware of those. You also want to make sure that you understand the process in New York uh, with respect to the New York specific testing that's done after you've passed the bar exam and also to the process of transferring your score. Because it's a UBE jurisdiction, you can transfer a score in, you can transfer a score out. You want to be pretty careful in following those rules. There are time limits uh, and there are certain restrictions. So uh, this is beyond the, the scope of the information we can give you. Just want to point out that you want to be checking with the bar examiners. If you've got a score that's better than 260, um, think about that as a way of transferring that score to another jurisdiction. If you did better than 266 in another UBE jurisdiction, think about transferring that in and becoming a member of the New York bar. So lots of different things going on there. Um, obviously, it's too early for us to know uh, how our students are doing. We've gotten a few uh, comments back and um, we'll see what the overall looks like. I suspect that um, it's going to be another tough exam generally. And uh, I, I think for repeat bar takers, 
again, it's going to be a very uh, challenging test. When you look at these overall numbers and you see the drop, I think you can tell that the repeat bar taker number uh, is pretty substantially low. And as a result, if you're a repeat bar taker in New York or anywhere else, I think you just need to recognize that you have to do something different. It's gonna take a substantial amount of work uh, to be able to pass the bar. And that leads me to, to wanna remind all of you that this coming Thursday, which would be October 25th at 7 p.m. Eastern, we're gonna do a live training called Do Something Different, Make the Next Bar Exam Your Last Bar Exam. In this training, I'm going to walk you through the four steps that our successful bar takers in New York and elsewhere have followed uh, for many years in order to pass their bar exams. And we're going to look at case studies of people who failed the bar and then passed and what they did differently. I'd love to have you join me for this free training. We finish it up with a live Q&A as well. Um, I think it's a great opportunity to, for me to hear your questions and to be able to respond. Now you do need to register for the training. Uh, it's completely free, but we do need your registration. If you're watching today's podcast as a video, and by the way, you can do that by going to celebrationbarreview.com slash 221, that's our episode number. Or if you're listening uh, to the podcast as an audio, in the show notes on both pages, you will see a link for the webinar, or you can go to our website at celebrationbarreview.com slash webinar, uh, and you can save your, speed, your spot there. Now, you'll also notice when you go to that webinar button that there is an on-demand daily version of the same information. You're welcome to select that instead. Obviously, it's not a live presentation, uh, so we don't get the opportunity to do Q&A, but um, it's the same information, and I think it would be a, a real value to you to participate. So if you can join me live, I'd love to have you uh, with us on Thursday night, the 25th, 7 p.m. Eastern, that's 4 o'clock Pacific time, talking about doing something different. I also want to remind you that we're now in that window in which we're really just a little more than four months until the next bar exam, actually 127 days to go. Um, and back in episode 74 of the podcast series, uh, we did a message about 127 days to go. So you might want to check that one out as well. All right. Well, I want to just jump in and we'll have more to say about New York and, and other results, perhaps Texas and Georgia as they come out in next week's episode. We've got some great interviews lined up for you uh, talking with successful students as well. But in today's, the rest of today's episode, what I wanted to do was to give you a little bit of an excerpt, a feeling uh, for what we do with our registered students every week. Uh, Kelly Perkins, who's a member of our staff, uh, comes on. We do live with Jackson and Kelly, and we take questions from our students and uh, just kind of uh, uh, talk about the, whatever's on their minds and things that they want to know about studying. Um, and so... Uh, in last week's uh, Q&A, we had some great questions, and I thought it might be interesting for you to just sort of uh, uh, take a sneak peek at what that looks and sounds like. We're going to talk about the, uh, the switch from Texas to the UBE starting in 2021. We're going to get some questions about photo reading, a tool that we recommend very strongly in this course. We've got a question about when should you begin your studying, and uh, that's a good question. And a question about taking weekends off when you're studying, uh, or what do you do if you're going to travel, if you're going to be away from home uh, during the time that you're studying. We're also going to talk about um, how you can follow the personalized study guide. Uh, how does the syllabus work and, and how to follow that? Uh, we got a question about lecture handouts. That was kind of a fun one, so we're going to talk a little bit about that and how that's used in other courses and why we don't use it. Um, and then we got a question about what do I do when my kids get sick and life kind of gets in the way, and I thought it was a really great question, so I wanted to share that with you. And then we're going to wrap up with some discussion about a tool called Mind Mapping, which uh, is something that we think is a great way to take notes and we've seen uh, tremendous success with. So talking about a wide range of issues, I think it's kind of fun. It's very informal and casual. Kelly asked me some questions. I riff on them. Uh, she occasionally tries to bring me back into uh, orbit, uh, but I go down a few foxholes for sure. So kind of a fun episode to, to share with you today. So what we want to do then is jump into that excerpt and then I'll wrap up at the very end. I do think Monday night, if, if I'm putting yeah. down a wager, Monday night, it's New York results night. That's my guess. Um, Texas results should be coming out, I would guess, near the end of next week. Now, typically the way Texas does it in their usual weird Texas way is they say results are coming on Monday and then they release them on Wednesday or Thursday. I really don't know why they do that, mm -hmm. but they do. So yeah. I would think we might get 
Texas next week also, Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and then Georgia, you know, once we get past, uh, you know, 15th, 20th of, of October, we're, it's fair game for Georgia results. Um, they're, they have a fondness for coming very close to Halloween. Uh, <laughs> but I think that um, any time from now on uh, is also open uh, for, for Georgia results. So those three big states, uh, we know we've got some smaller UBE states continuing to release. And then the only remaining big state will be California, which as always will come right before Thanksgiving. So kind of kind of wild. There are just some wins really. that you just, you know, I want everybody to win. I know everybody works and everybody's got their story, right? Uh, but there are some that, that you just root for and you just really want to win. And we got a big win uh, in Arizona uh, in the UBE this week that we weren't, uh, we hadn't heard from this student. And then suddenly, I mean, a few days after results, it's like, oh, I wanted to let you know, I not only passed, I passed by a huge amount. And uh, th this will be a great story to us. This was the second try with us and moved her scores way up the first time, but not quite to passing. This time went way over the top uh, and is uh, licensed, going to be licensed, potentially could license in 15 states. Uh, what a story. I mean, awesome. And she's going to do an interview with me next week. So we'll get that posted uh, right up there. And I've got some other, um, you know, uh, uh, other interviews scheduled. So the other thing I wanted to say in terms of bar exam news, Texas, uh, this is this won't actually affect any of you, but just so that yeah. you know, pay attention. <laughs> it's Texas exciting will, for us. <laughs> it's exciting for us. Texas is switching to the UBE, but hold, take a breath, not until February of 2021. By then you'll all be lawyers and, you know, your babies will be taking the Texas bar. Uh, <laughs> but um, that, that's what we're looking at is February 2021, uh, the Texas Supreme Court uh, confirmed that this week. So there you go. So there will be a day when oil and gas is no longer something that people have to learn in order to pass wow. the Texas bar. Yeah, I know. It's hard to believe, isn't it? And two days. Yeah, not two days, days, not two and a half. Uh, I mean, yeah. a lot of changes. No P and E, I mean, mm -hmm. at, at least as far as the bar exam part. So that's, that's uh, kind of where we're at. I noticed there is a uh, program called photo reading. What are the <laughs> benefits of using that? So many. So it's a great question. Yeah. Um, photo reading is the game changer. I, I often say to people, it's like if you were trying to screw a screwdriver into the wall and in, in, screw into the wall and you had the, a rusted out old screwdriver and it didn't fit the head size properly. And you're like, and you're missing. And, you know, and I walk by with a power screwdriver and I say, oh, hey, Kelly, you want to use a power screwdriver to put that in? You go, no, 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 no. I really like this screwdriver that doesn't work and doesn't fit and it's slow and painful. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the difference between regular reading and photo reading. Regular reading is 110 words a minute with 50% comprehension. That is the statistical norm for people in law and in medicine. Photo reading has reading speeds up to 25,000 words a minute. So 110 versus 110 words period, there's no zeros behind that, versus 25,000 words. Wow. And photo reading has comprehension as high as 75%. Now, photo reading is completely different. It is whole mind. It is reading to the non-conscious brain. You're a photo reader. Can mm -hmm. you just sort of describe how different that is for you than, than normal reading? I think that it was hard for me to start, and I'm still very much a novice, but when you're just flipping the pages, it's very hard to understand that you're actually absorbing that material. Um, but then what I've heard from students is that after a week or two of doing this continuously, they start to notice that, oh, I just, I just know this one as C. You know, I just know it. Or I, I was typing out my essay and I just typed out all of these things and they just flew right out of my fingers. So I think it's just one, it really cuts down on the reading time of course, and with everyone as busy as they are, I think that's the number one bonus of this. And two, with the absorption rate, like what you were saying, you're not memorizing things. You're not like getting right. exhausted doing this. Yeah. Um, and so that when you go, go into the materials, you're kind of more fresh and you can just do, right? Yeah. yeah so absolutely. I think those are the positives that I've heard from students. Yeah, photo reading is the game changer for most people. Um, it's how we see the kind of results I was just talking about earlier in the call where somebody goes from a very low score to a very high score rapidly. How does that happen? Well, it's not because they worked harder. 
It's not because they work more hours. It's not because they suddenly got smarter. It's in general because they're taking better advantage of their whole mind, their genius mind, uh, by taking advantage of photo reading or paraliminal recordings uh, to help take away the blocks that might be in your, your, your mindset. Um, so lots of information about photo reading. If you've just joined the course, you will get emails from us with links to videos I've done about photo reading. Uh, there's also an introductory um, photo reading webinar. Uh, that's free when you purchase photo reading, but you can buy just the webinar for $95 if you just want to invest that to find out more about it beyond the videos I've done that are free. So I encourage you to check it out. Not everyone uses it, but I would say we're at about 60, maybe 70% of our students are photo readers. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I don't know many people that would, would say other than the fact that they think it makes a big difference. And you'll notice when I do the interviews with people, yeah. uh, you know, virtually all of them are photo readers uh, in the, the, the successful students. So there you go. Okay, yes. good. Okay. And also, I signed up for tutoring. When does that start? Yeah. Um, again, new students sometimes try and put us in the paradigm of, you know, Kaplan, Barbary kind of course where everyone starts on the same date and does the same assignments you know, at the same time. We don't do that. Everybody starts and, and it's sort of make your own journey. We have the study guide and the study guide has the order of assignments. And early in the study guide, you will have a writing assignment, regardless of which state you're in. Mm -hmm. And it will say, do this essay, essay number one in this subject and submit it to me or to you, depending on what mm -hmm. the, the circumstances are. You'll then submit that by email. And then you'll go to Calendly, which is the, the, the app that uh, holds our uh, appointment uh, links. And there's a special link you use and you will schedule your call with us. And that's how the process begins. Um, typically, if you're taking the February exam, uh, we would be talking to you about once a week uh, right now. As we get closer to the exam, depending on when people start, we may be talking to some folks two or three times a week. But in general, we try to, 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 we assume about once a week is usually enough, yeah. uh, given, you know, how do we get through 15 calls, which is the personal coaching program. So mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's when it starts. It starts when you get to the first assignment that is to write an essay or a performance test and send it in. Okay. And also give us 24 hours to yeah. review it. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Maybe not for Jackson. No, no. I, you know, but for me, I know, that the, I know there are people that think that they can send an essay and, and schedule a call for like 20 minutes later. And, and then I have to say, you know, yeah. well, I could photo read it and I do. Um, I also try to read a little differently for the purposes of, of mentoring. So you got to give me a little time. I have to process what I've read. So yeah, yeah. there you go. Okay. And me more. So how, you know, be nice to us. Okay. Yeah, um, be, nice to, be nice to us. Yeah. She's so busy. <laughs> She sold out, you know, me. Pff, nah, okay. I got okay. time. All right. Okay. Okay. He's got lots more students. <laughs> it's his business. He's doing fine. But yes, sign up with him. It's great, great, great. Yeah. Okay. June, um, yeah. I'm going to take one from the comments section because we're moving on to okay. study strategy questions. And Akuto okay. asked, do you recommend taking weekends off, um, going out of the country and um, studying for a certain period of time? Um, well, weekends, uh, not necessarily. I think that, you know, 20 hours a week is what we recommend that you study. Now, I don't really care how those 20 hours come out. If you want to do your 20 hours by doing four hours a day, five days a week and take the weekends off. Okay. That, that works. Mm -hmm. Um, if you want to do your studying on the weekends and take the weeks off or weeknights off, that's okay too. Um, I think, you know, that. so that's the first question. The second part of this is if you are uh, going out of the country to study, I guess, um, it depends on how long you're gone for. If you have a trip plan that's a va family vacation, let me just offer a word to the wise. Don't try to study on your family vacation. You will piss off everybody around you. Your studies yeah. will be ineffective. Uh, and it will just be a big mess. And people say, why did we spend all this money to go here for you to open up your bar review books? It's the same thing. We talk about it at holiday times. I yes. This really drives me nuts. Christmas. Yeah. Yes. Please don't bring your bar review books to the Thanksgiving table or don't sit at the Halloween, you know, giving out the candy, reading your bar review books. I mean, really, you know, we get people it. People know harder. you're studying. Yeah, people they know. They're aware. Yeah. <laughs> You know, just don't, don't do that. It, all you do is just irritate everybody around you. 
Now, if you're going to be gone for an extended period of time, you're going to have to study. So you got to bring your materials or have access online. But if you're going away for a weekend, you know, you're going to go to Jazz Fest in New Orleans. Mm, I could or, do that this know, year. Yeah, you, you could. Yes. Um, or you're, you know, whatever you're doing. Right. Uh, and if it's just a short little trip, then don't bother trying to study. Right. Mm -hmm. So. You know, the, the, the answer to everything is always common sense. Just use your common sense. Make sure you've got your, your studies. You're getting your 20 hours a week yet. Okay. Just a little confused about um, how to follow the study guide. Um, do I do exactly four hours a day or complete the whole uh, checkbox? Um, you do what you're able to do, right? If you have four hours and you've got four hours worth of assignments, great. And then it, it works out. Sometimes people think that that grid is a day's assignment. It's not. It's just an assignment. And if that if it takes you two or three days to do an assignment, as mm -hmm. long as you don't extend the length of time, the total number of hours you spend right. beyond what we've suggested, then you're fine. So if you see a six to eight hour assignment, well, it's not likely you're going to do that in one day. Maybe it'll take you two or three days, but you don't want to spend 12 hours doing the six hour assignments. So six hours spread as you've got to do it. Again, kind of common sense as you're working through it. My mm -hmm. suggestion to people is when your study period is up, mark where you stopped and pick up there the next mm -hmm. time. If you finish an assignment during your study period, just go on to the next assignment. Um, so uh, I think you can make it work pretty flexibly what we're really trying to do is give you the order and the length of time and not to say, well, oh, you got to do this on Wednesday because there's no need for that. Yeah. And this is kind of in the same vein. Um, okay. um, I'm about to begin watching the UBE lecture and I wanted to know if there is a lecture handout. Mm -hmm. Again, this is the paradigm of Barbary or Kaplan, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't do lecture handouts because all the materials in the uh, lecture, in the uh, written material and then in the lecture. Um, I would just say, if you're new to us and you've come out of a traditional big box bar review, you should be prepared for a lot of things being done differently. Mm -hmm. This is one of them. Um, we would we would suggest that you either read quickly or photo read. Then you're going to have a lecture on the material. Then you're going to have question practice uh, to be doing. And then you're going to go back and do it again. And then you're going to go back and do it again. And then you're going to go back and do it still a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time. So don't worry about getting it all the first time through. Um, we don't give lecture handouts because we don't need them. And, um, you know, you'll, you'll be okay. So that's. Oh, I remember those actually. I remember that. It's like you yeah. fill in the blank as you listen to. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't get that the first time I read that you know, question. You know, you know why they do that is because <laughs> the lecturers are so bad that people just used to get up and walk out of the room. It's totally boring. Uh, yeah. Yeah, they were really boring. I mean, it's yeah. like. Really? Could you find any more boring? And, and people don't know this, but <laughs> <laughs> the boring. Well gonna, let's go down the rabbit hole no for boring. just a minute. Okay, we're going to go down the rabbit hole. So in the early days of Bar Review, and they were the, the classic at this, is they would want to get themselves into a law school. So they'd go to the dean and they'd say, what professors are you having trouble retaining? And they'd say, oh, Professor Smith, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. Nobody likes Professor Smith, but, but everybody loves Professor Jones. And they'd say, well, I'll tell you what, we'll hire Professor Jones and Professor Smith to teach for the bar review and we'll pay them an extraordinary amount of money so that you can keep them on the faculty and you don't have to give them extra stuff and they won't have to do all this work. And everybody will love to come to our course because we've got Professor Jones that everybody loves. Well, that was easy. But when Professor Smith got up to give the lecture, oh my God, terrible, right? Early on said, this is not gonna work. We gotta use fill in the blanks and lecture handouts so that people will stay in the lecture. And that's where it came from. So again, wow. great teaching, uh, totally motivated by the best uh, interest of the students, as I'm sure you can tell. Mm -hmm. And you wonder why I'm a little cynical about these guys. <laughs> so there you go. All right. Oh, man. All right, next question. These past two weeks, there has been a halt in my studies. Last week, I had a bit of a family issue, but I was ready to get back to work this week. Then my daughter got sick. Um, and now she's on the mend, but I've been unable to study for almost two weeks now. I think I should be back at my study regimen this weekend, barring any more unexpected surprises. Am I doing all right? Yeah. You know, some version of this question comes up a lot, right? We, yeah. we hear this a lot. Stuff happens. Um, elections happen. Uh, fiancés come to town. Uh, <laughs> <you know. laughs> Medical issues you're not expecting. All of these things. Right. Yeah. right. Babies are born. Grandbabies yeah. are born. Stuff happens. 
and it'll throw you off your game, right? You'll say, you know, well, I plan to get through this, this, and this this week. Well, it didn't happen. So now what do you do? Two weeks, uh, if we were a couple weeks before the exam, would be catastrophic. Two weeks right now, it's annoying more than anything. So here's what I would do. Um, I would make sure you get 20 hours of study in this week. And if you can get 25 in, even better. Yeah. Um, if you can do 25 for a couple weeks in a row, even better. You, it, you're you not behind because remember that for the person that wrote this, there are people that are still waiting to get their results, like California bar takers who won't even know right. if they can start until Thanksgiving, which is why I talk about not bringing your bar review books to the Thanksgiving yeah. table. Or so, law students who don't even graduate until right. December right. and they don't start. So, yeah. Exactly. So don't don't beat yourself up about it. You do what you can do. Um, I think that when stuff happens, you just have to recognize that you're going to do the best you can and try to stay consistent. But don't then add on and make yourself feel worse. Don't say to yourself, well, I'm going to do 40 hours this week when you know you aren't going to do 40. And then yeah. you feel really, really bad because you didn't get to 40. But maybe you got 20 in and 20 would have been good. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's the steadiness, I think, that, that we're more interested in. Yes. Forgive yourself and move on to the next week. Yeah, I think so. Good, so. good advice. Okay. Um, reading. Once subject has been photo read and mind mapped, should it be re photo read again? If so, yes. how often? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, this is a great question. Mm -hmm. um, you should photo read as many times as you can. The beauty of photo reading is that you can photo read even a full length big outline in 15, 20 minutes, sometimes less. The more times you photo read, you're layering on top in your non conscious mind the information. So you should photo read before every lecture on the subject, before every essay you write on the subject, before every set of multi state questions that touch on the subject. You should photo read periodically just to photo read it. Um, you should be working with the mind maps continuously. I think there are more questions about that, so I don't want to jump ahead too far. Yeah. But as to the question of photo reading multiple times, the answer is yes. Most students that I talk to who are successful on the exam and we're doing interviews, if I say, how many times did you photo read a subject, will say to me 30, 40, 50 times. I mean, you know, some of them will say, I, I lost count. I have no idea how many. It was a lot. So that's the advantage, I think, that you get to. Yeah. And you're right. It does go on to the second question is about mind mapping. Um, okay. So how often should we review prior mind maps, given that we will be covering and mind mapping other subjects? Yeah, uh, I, again, great question. I think that th the real value of a mind map is I've as we've started to work with it and talking and I did a great interview this last week with Claire Walls, who passed in Florida, and she talks about mind mapping. And she says, I didn't get the mind mapping memo first time through until late in the game. Uh -huh. So the second time I got it and I started doing it, it made a big difference for her. Mind mapping is something that's dynamic. And in order to make it dynamic, it means that you're constantly adding to it. As you do questions, you're adding to your mind map. As you're photo reading again and then activating with super dip and skim or rhythmic perusal or rapid read, you're adding to your mind map. I think that um, you should be constantly reviewing the mind maps. But one of the best ways to do this is literally to read the mind map, each mind map out loud as though you're presenting it to a group of people. And then record that uh, as you're reading it out loud. Just take your phone. Every phone today, I think, has got a, a, a built-in recorder. And record it and then save that recording. Now, that you can save to an MP3. <laughs> and then yes. um, put it, play it back, put it on repeat, turn the volume down to absolute minimum, zero volume, because even though you can't consciously hear it, your non-conscious can, our, our sense of hearing is much, much greater than what we've got uh, consciously. Put the, the phone, you know, plug it into the power, put it under your pillow at night, and let it run on repeat with that particular mind map. If you wake up in the middle of the night with that running and you're like, okay, I'm up all of a sudden. I don't know why. <laughs> it's really your brain saying, shut it off. We're done. We've heard enough. Um, but short of that, just let it run. And then the next night do a different mind map and so on. Uh, and I think that's a good way to get through them. The more mind mapping you can do, I think the better off you are. Okay. Because I mean, think about it when you were taking notes and I know you were like a massive note taker. I loved you. Didn't, 
I know you loved your notes, but you didn't actually like you didn't sleep with your notes. You didn't no, have your I notes. I didn't read my notes. I never read right, them again. You took them. Right. You took them. <laughs> and there's value in taking them. But the value in mind mapping is that you're using all of your brain instead of just the front part of your brain. And then you get to keep using it. It's dynamic. Yeah. Traditional note taking is static. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's the difference for me. The last question pertains to the time it takes to build one mind build one's mind maps, if I could talk. Mm -hmm. My initial uh, mind map is created from the topics contained in the subject's table of contents. I then begin right. to enrich the mind maps with the lectures. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem, however, is that this process is taking me twice the time allotted for the lecture and the syllabus, sometimes a little bit more. How much attention to detail should um, one's mind map have in it? Uh, what is a reasonable amount of time to invest in building one's mind map? Okay. Uh, again, great questions. I think that most of the time invested in the mind map should come out of the reading portion of your study guide. Um, when you are listening to the lecture, as I said, my goal is that you listen to it holistically, that you listen to it without much interruption. So I wouldn't do a lot of addition to your mind map from the lecture um, first time through. I would just sort of let that flow. Then you're going back to read again. If you if you're in a multi-state subject, you had you know first half of the outline, but you're really photo reading the whole outline. Then you're doing the lecture. Then you're going back to the next reading assignment, uh, which is the second half. You're going to photo read the whole outline. Now you've got another two or three hours to work on the mind map, and this comes from now having heard the lecture, the first lecture, and your reading and your activation. Mm -hmm. Then you're listening to the second lecture, not much mind mapping, but now you get to the question practice, multiple choice or essay. Now you're back into the mind mapping. So I don't think you need to mind map a whole lot from the lecture. The purpose and the way that I'm lecturing, uh, people comment on this sometimes. I speak very rapidly when I lecture, yeah. right? You, yeah. Okay. Um, and I do that deliberately because I don't want you slowing down and doing a lot of notes, whether it's static notes or mind map notes. It's not what I'm looking for. And I know some of you are like, all right, I'm going to listen to one sentence and I'm going to stop it and then I'm going to mind map. it." No, don't do that. I'm not trying to get you to, to think that way about it at all. I want you to hear the whole lecture so that you get the general sense of the, the material. And then you can listen to the lecture multiple times, many times. This is one of the beauties of our structure. And as you're doing it, things may stop. If you're on a second or a third listen, you may go, whoa, wait a minute, I get that. Stop. Then you might add to a mind map. Uh, but the idea is that you're really saving so much time in the reading part. Because mm -hmm. you know, let's think about it. When you read a, a, a bar exam subject outline, traditional reading, you spent hours doing that, right? Yes. I mean, yes. I don't know, I mean, six I hours, the, eight hours, ten hours. Yeah, the three hours for each half section. So, yeah. Yes. And, and you were pushing it and you were pushing hard to get. Yeah. To, yeah. So if, if a person's in a Barbary or a Kaplan course, they're reading, you know, see the tort. You yeah. Know, <laughs> right? You know, 12 hours to read, you know, a, an outline. Mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> this is important because blank. You, you get in that circumstance, I think, where, uh, you know, again, the paradigm is different and you don't want to get trapped into that paradigm. Find your own way through it. I know some people spend extraordinary amounts of time with their mind maps. Others spend less time. In general, and I'm, I'm, I am generalizing, but in general, the people who spend more time with their mind maps seem to do better. So that would be my thought. Yeah. Okay. One last question. If anyone else has questions, please put them in the comment box now. Yeah. Um, but I have, if I purchase photo reading, how will I integrate it in my schedule? That's a good question, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, basically, your schedule will be the same, except that you'll be photo reading multiple times. So we'll send you an email after you've registered for photo reading. Uh, well, that's a look at our uh, Q&A from last week. It's not all the questions we've got, but I thought it gave you a feeling for the way that that goes. That is a service that we provide for all of our registered students. We uh, do a live Q&A, and then we uh, make it available on replay to all of our students. So kind of fun. I think you get a feeling for the uh, the kinds of things people are asking right now at this stage as we're about four months until the bar exam, and uh, also with the uh, results coming up. 
For those of you that got your New York results today, hope they were favorable. If they weren't, I really encourage you uh, to check out our free live training. Again, it's this Thursday, the 25th at 7 p.m. Eastern, titled Do Something Different, Make the Next Bar Exam Your Last Bar Exam. We're going to show you exactly what you need to do in order to pass the bar. We're going to share case studies of students who did exactly those steps, how it worked for them and why it worked. I think you're going to find it really useful, and so I hope you'll join us for that. I hope that uh, for those of you waiting for your results, Texas, Georgia, other states, we know there are some other UBE states releasing this week, um, and certainly for those of you waiting for California in November, uh, continue to hang in there for a while longer. Uh, the results will eventually get here for all of the states. Um, we wish everybody good luck on their results. For those that didn't pass, don't give up. Uh, you can pass the exam, and uh, that's really been our, our approach here with so many people for so many years, and we see it happen over and over again. So I really want to leave you with that note of encouragement. It can be done. You can pass, and we look forward to that. So take care, everyone. Thanks for being with us, and we will see you again next week uh, when hopefully we've got more information and more results. Bye-bye, everybody.